big topics, big ideas, and practical policy solutions. This is Leaders on the Frontier with your host, David Lees. It's November 17, 2022, and I'm your host today, David Lees, and welcome to Leaders on the Frontier, where we talk about big ideas and solutions that serve Canadians well. Our topic today is law. Specifically, we're talking about the state of law in Canada. And I find this a fascinating topic, and I hope you do too as well. The rule of law has really been the cornerstone of our Western civilization, indeed Canada. It protects freedom of the individual from arbitrary state action and power. Indeed, it is also about respect for freedom and confidence in the neutral application of law in what we call our Anglo-Saxon tradition of law. And that really has been foundational to the success of Canada. But is this long tradition being undermined? What is the state of law in Canada? So today, we're going to dare to ask the question, are these freedoms and rights of Canadians, and frankly, the law, in jeopardy? With me here today is renowned Queen's legal scholar and the executive director of Rights Probe, a law and liberty think tank, and that is Professor Bruce Party. Bruce Party has long argued that Canada is a country in peril due to an expansive state and a progressive ideology that has infected the legal system. He, in fact, warned of the dire consequences of COVID lockdowns, and we're delighted that Bruce could join us today. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we have um, uh, quite a far-reaching uh, discussion at hand here, and I'm very excited about it. And it's really an honor to relate to you, uh, Bruce, because um, you I recall you well as uh, COVID-19 uh, arose, that you were one of the very few voices uh, raising uh, concerns and questions regarding law. But I did want to set the stage a little bit um, about yourself. And that is, why did you decide to become a lawyer and a legal scholar no less, Bruce? Well, that, that, that's a great question. I was a student, uh, an undergraduate student. I hadn't finished my first degree yet. And I was taking, as you do early in your degree, I was taking a variety of courses in various disciplines. And I was going in to listen to these professors talk about their subject matter, political science and anthropology and so on. And each of them were giving me a different version of the world and insisting that that version was true. And I came to the point of thinking, well, I, I don't want your version of the world. I just want to know what the ground rules are. I want to know what the rules are. I want to know what people can make me do and make me say and where they can't. And so I figured the place to learn the rules are is law school. And so I, I actually decided that I wanted to go to law school as opposed to wanting to be a lawyer. I ended up being a lawyer as well, but uh, that 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 wasn't the first and foremost point. It's very interesting. So why, frankly, is law so important for the lives of Canadians? It, it's the foundation for everything else. If, if you have a society governed by a robust rule of law, then everything else can function. You know, your contracts can be honored. You have the freedom to compete in the, in the marketplace. Your safety will be, will be protected. You won't have people uh, attacking each other in the streets. You'll resolve things peacefully, hopefully, rather than by violence. Um, your relationships and your employment, all of those things depend upon a legal system working properly and in accordance with a certain set of ground rules. And if you don't have the, that, that working very well, if you lose sight of those ground rules, then everything else sort of becomes up for grabs. So it, it has a high functioning legal system or justice system has profound economic and social benefits. Oh, absolutely. You, you're, you're, the operation of your economic system depends upon the way your legal system works. I mean, they're, they're not two separate spheres. One is dependent upon the other. And, and so if your legal system goes wrong, then everything else that you know in a society is in peril. 
Okay, so no, it, it's it's almost overwhelming then, isn't it? The the implications, if you think of patent law, the ability to patent ideas and knowledge and safeguard that, but in a way that's efficient as well, is 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 vital, isn't it? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, so patent law is an interesting one to bring up because patent law has both benefits and 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 costs to it because it. On the one hand, people argue that without patents, you don't have the incentive to invent and create things. But on the other hand, patent law gives property rights over ideas. You mentioned ideas before. And those ideas, especially if they are in the form of technology, provides those parties with the patents, with the ability, frankly, to, to limit the, the civil liberties of people who would otherwise be free to explore those ideas. And so it's it's not it's not really a black and white thing. There are a lot of people who say, and I might be one of them, who say that the 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 concept of patents is is a bit of a difficult one. So, looking at law, then strategically from a larger society point of view, law is critical not only for kind of practical day to day life, the economy we've mentioned, but also as it really gets into realms of social cooperation, right? So. Um, this really becomes a very moral issue. This this issue is is very moral in its nature, is it not? Well, yes, it is, of course. And, and you know, one of the benefits, if there are any, and maybe there aren't, any, but what one of the dark silver linings of this COVID period has been that people have been able to see how directly the law matters to their lives every single day lives because if the law says well you can't open your business today well you know what else are you supposed to do and that comes from the law it's the legal system that created that rule it's the legal system that allowed the rule to to continue uh and and, and so if nothing else this past Two and a half to three years has been an opportunity for people to have a you know a good hard realistic look at the state of the laws that govern them in their everyday lives and and the and the sight I think is is not pretty. And in, indeed, ask fundamental questions. What does it mean to be free as an individual? What does it mean to be free? Exactly so. And one of the difficulties in the period that we're in is that you have certain um constituencies in society who are not even agreeing about what these basic concepts mean so if you were to ask um well a variety of institutions or leaders what they meant by freedom or what they meant by the rule of law you would get quite different answers i think uh, now, I would say that freedom means the ability to go about your business as you please without interference from the state. Okay. Right? And we can go into that about what, what, what the competing con conceptualization of freedom is, but it's quite a different thing. Yeah, so that's a very important point that we'll get to, is this almost a breakdown of that consensus outside that realms of that, frankly, Anglo-Saxon tradition that we probably take for granted. Oh, we do indeed. We and and this is this is part of what's happened in this moment. People have seen what's going on and think, well, how can this be? I mean, because there are certain very well established ideas that they hold in their heads, and, and rightly so, that are not being honored. Wow. And it's hard to figure out why and and how we got to here. Okay, so we're going to kind of bring this larger conversation together over the next hour or so, because it's, it's really a profound conversation. Um, and I think it's fascinating because I suspect, I mean, you've said this, and I've noticed this over your writings, is that you really do raise the flag that you'd say our country is in peril. And I think a lot of Canadians would be quite frankly shocked to hear that, that statement. Um, so what do you really mean at the heart of that? Right. Good question. So what I do not mean is that we're about to be invaded from without. We're not, we're not about to be taken over by somebody. Yeah. But what I do mean is that we are slowly being taken over by what I might call a, a, a technocratic aristocracy. Hmm. More and more, our society is being dominated by an expansive managerial state. 
and it is dominating uh, life in, in all corners of society. It is directing and supervising and subsidizing and taxing and regulating and, uh, and, and directing and, and, and the, whole, the whole shebang. It, it, is, it is driving the bus. Hmm. And if, if you are a person who, who thinks that you want to live in a free society and what you mean by that is that you essentially have control over your own life, that you will decide who to make contracts with, who to do business with, how to carry on, to make your own moral judgments about your own speech and your own behavior. Well, as time goes on, that kind of freedom becomes more and more difficult. And the legal system in many ways has, has facilitated this managerial state's ability to do as it has done. Well. Wow. So are you saying, okay, so just repeat that because this is kind of mind-blowing. So you're saying that there's a technocratic managerial class coming out of the state by and large, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And and the law is really used to serve them or their objectives rather than the people. Is that it? Without Yes, I, I think it has become a, a, we talked a moment ago about the ideas people have in their heads, the self-evident ideas that they have in their heads. Well, one of the self-evident evident ideas that the political class has in its head is that, well, of course, the job of government is to manage society for the greater good. And it is the job of people with expertise to make policy and to tell us all what to do in the interest of that greater mm -hmm. good. Wow. And as long as you have those two ideas being embraced by the political class, by the legal profession, by the courts, by the government, as long as you have those two ideas in, in play, it's very difficult to sort of put your hand up and say, well, hold on, what, 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 about, what about my freedom? Because you know, individual freedom is going to be an inconvenience mm -hmm. to those two ideas, and 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 they're and people who are are playing out those two ideas are going to view it as an inconvenience. That I'm sorry, every once in a while we're going to have to set it aside, just as they did during COVID. COVID is very interesting because it seemed like a sudden thing, and it suddenly turned our country upside down, and it did in many ways. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand. It was also a culmination of a whole lot of ideas that have already been in progress for a long time. And the, the, the COVID reaction was only possible because those ideas have been in development for such a long time. Okay, so this is fascinating. Um, so we're starting up front with that very profound thesis. And so what I'd like to do now, and this is a far-reaching conversation today, uh, Bruce, but... Um, Frankly, I want to reflect a little bit on the larger historical, if not strategic, context of the law, because the evolution of our rights and freedoms, the law, has happened over a long, long time. You could argue it goes back thousands of years, obviously, to Greece and Rome, and, and of course, uh, more recently, uh, about a thousand years ago, as, as we look at the Magna Carta and things like that in uh, in England. But if we look at this um, history of evolution of the law, it's not been an easy one. And uh, I guess I'd like to start off with the question that's very simple. Where do rights come from? Do they come from the state, the king, or do they come from God, or e.g. were we born with them? Right. Well, so that depends on the kind of question that you're asking. If you're, if you're asking a moral question, about you know what our moral rights are or what our legal rights ought to be, then I, I think you could make a case for 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 God or for philosophy or for for you know for some other source than the law itself, certainly than the king. But if you're asking that question legally, then then the question becomes a much a shallower question, but also a much simpler one to answer, which is, yeah, rights come from the law. And the test about whether you have a legal right, not whether you should have one, but whether you actually do have one, it, it has a very simple equation, which is, 
if you have a if you have a right that's been breached and you go to a court and you say my right's been breached please give me a remedy and the court says no i'm sorry not today please go away well that means you actually don't have the legal right that you say that you did it might be that you should have and it might be that that court's answer wasn't consistent with the way the law maybe should have evolved but but the proof of the pudding in the legal sense is in the eating there's there's no right without a remedy the saying goes. okay yeah right so that i think that's a very good caveat but so i want to go then into a little bit more of a discussion around what makes what are the signs of a high functioning justice system right so we would say in a free society we know that all lawmaking and law enforcement must follow principles of justice and principles that are so rooted in um frankly our collective sense of humanity that we would say them say they're natural justice is that correct well yes in a way but so there's a danger here too though because when we start talking about the collective notions of things the danger there is that that it might be that the collective notion changes into something else that's very dark and that's part of the problem that's happening right now i think the collective okay. notions of things are not collective anymore or or at least there there is no one singular collective set of premises and so for my money the the the, the proper ordering of a legal system is not necessarily based upon popular consensus i mean that's very important of course it's it popular consensus always has a huge role to play in driving where a country goes but, okay but for, for my money i would i would i would put value on a certain set of principles that 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 makes sense in logic so for example you mentioned earlier the rule of law just for a moment let's just consider what the rule of law means and one way i think the best way to to encapsulate what it means is to contrast it with its opposite and its opposite is the rule of persons so we have the rule of law and the rule of persons and the whole point of the rule of law is to protect us from the rule of persons mm -hmm. and what we mean by the rule of persons is concentrated power in the hands of individuals like the king and one of the ways to make sure that the king or today the equivalent, the, 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 the government, the executive branch of government, doesn't have that concentrated power and that we're not subject to their rule is to separate powers between different branches of the state. Okay, so exactly. Right. So these are, these are these practical principles of a high functioning legal system. So exactly. you mentioned, yeah. so laws would be known and clear, correct? Yeah, correct. And they're predictable. In other words, they can't be applied in retrospect to something that happened in the past, right? Because that would be totally unfair. Right. 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 And, and, the, and the premise of those three ideas that you've just mentioned is this. It's supposed to work so that citizens are able to know and understand the law so that they can govern themselves accordingly. It's not supposed to be a gotcha thing so that somebody does something the state mm -hmm. comes along and changes the law and says, oh, by the way, we just changed the law. And by the way, yesterday you did this. And we, so we got you now. Yeah. It's supposed to be so that people are able to rule themselves. Exactly. With the knowledge, pre-knowledge of what, what, the, what the law requires of them. Yeah. So there can be order without command from the king. Oh, um, that's right. So, so what about the presumption of innocence? Yes. Well, so that, that, the rationale for that is 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 similar in the sense that it reflects an onus upon the state. In other words, it reflects the default position. Let's just let's just let's just talk about the default position first. This we have we 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 I think we are able to identify what I might call the first principle of a property functioning legal system. The very first principle. The first principle is what's the default position? And the default position in our system is supposed to be that you can do anything you want, anywhere, anyhow, unless, unless there's a law that says you can't. A guardrail. That's the default, right? So if the law is silent, then you're free. And it's not the reverse. It's not that you can't do anything unless there's a law that says you can't. No, 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 no. Other way around. 
the onus is upon the, is upon the state both to create the prohibition in a proper way and to enforce the prohibition and to show with their onus beyond a reasonable doubt that you breach the prohibition so the onus is all upon the state and not upon the citizen to establish their own freedom so our default is enabling freedom not denying it yeah the the, the, the default is to uh, to presume freedom freedom is the it, it, if i put it this way freedom is the starting position okay so the other practical principle of of natural justice would be courts they're independent right. you reference they're separate from political power is that right that's correct that's correct yeah um what about the importance of property rights and freedom well so in a in a genuinely free society um you can't function if you don't have property rights because property rights are the thing that you create and buy and sell and live by. I mean, people think of property sometimes as this sort of specialized idea, um, but it's it's really not. It's, it's front and center in a society where you are free to go and work for yourself or for other people to make things and sell them and to buy things from other people when you're when you're buying and selling things what you are actually buying and selling i mean it looks like you're going to the store to buy a bar a, 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 a basket of apples but what you're really doing is buying the property rights in the apples and so if you don't have property rights you can't buy and sell and so property rights are absolutely central to the whole idea of a free society Okay, so this is a profound summation because if we reflect back on your earlier thesis about, say, the, I'm trying to remember the phrase, the managerial technoclass, sure. as the state becomes so huge and complex, yeah. what chance does any citizen have to navigate this world? It be, and yeah. all these things become in jeopardy. Is that kind of That's what you're getting true. at? Yeah. And as time has gone on, this is one of the problems. Our laws have become so voluminous, um, so so comprehensive, and in the sense that they are, are touching everything more and more, they are um, discretionary, and and they tend to be imprecise in many situations. Their enforcement is discretionary. Their meaning is unclear. Uh, the access to uh, to to the courts is is very difficult, very expensive, very slow. And so the citizen is left adrift. I mean, number one, they can't figure out what the law means. Number two, if they get into trouble, they can't get help to get themselves out of it. it it's it. They are they are at the mercy of all of these legal institutions, both the legal profession, the courts, the governments, the the agencies that have the have been given in statute the mandate essentially to make policy as they go along. Um, and, and so it's very difficult now to nail down what your legal obligations are without formal legal help. But it, it, it's it's frankly disturbing, isn't it? Like it's, it's oppressive in nature because how do you navigate life, let alone operate a business where, oh, I don't know if you're a farmer, you have some body of water temporarily exist on your field you could have some kind of federal body intervene and i know this has happened to uh, sure. people i know suddenly they claim jurisdiction from an environmental point on on this it's 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 crazy so is this the kind of world that we're we're in now aren't well, we i'm, I'm going to go back to your your question about what i mean when i say the country is in peril this is what i mean i mean that 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 people are finding themselves at a loss when they're trying to figure out where they stand on things. I mean, environmental laws are, are a very good example of this, not the only by any means, but they're mm -hmm. a good example of, of, of a, 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 a legal regime in which it just can't be sure when and why you're on one side of the line on the, or the other one uh, because of the way the laws are written, the way the discretion works in their enforcement, uh, the judgment, the political judgment calls that are made along the way in terms of what governments are concerned about and not concerned about, um, it, it, and, and, the, and frankly, the, the, the powers that um, the executive branch is given to pursue pursue situations that they just don't like, and the inconsistencies that you can find in when they choose to do so and when they choose not to, 
in in all these respects, um, the 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 little guy, the citizen, uh, has basically been is in danger of being steamrolled over in the interests of allowing the imperatives of this managerial state to carry on. Well, and you can see how this type of posture that would create enormous fear and unease among uh, citizens, uh, where you would frankly want to um, avoid doing lots of activity and moving forward in your life or let alone your economy. Um, and in doing so, that, that really affects our culture, does it not? Oh yeah, sure, uh, absolutely. It it it, it fosters uh, distrust. It fosters division. It fosters resentment. Um, it fosters a feeling of helplessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it it should be the case. So let's just contrast the situation that we're in that we that we've been describing to a different kind of legal regime, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we 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 come from a common law system, and we still have common law in our in our law. For sure. I mean, contract law is largely common law. Property law is largely common law. Tort, negligence law. Uh, so it's it's still very important. But um, you can imagine a legal system that is basically run on a set of principles that define the nature of the relationship between citizen and other people and citizen and the state. And it's not always the case that every single case is going to be clear. That's not what I'm suggesting, because there's there's inherent ambiguity ambiguities in laws and principles, in mm -hmm. rules and principles. But you can at least find out to some extent what the principles are and the fact that they make sense and they fit together, they're coherent. What we have now is a plethora of, of statutes and regulations and guidelines and policies of all different kinds. And sometimes they're consistent and sometimes they're not. And sometimes you can find them and sometimes you can't. And sometimes you can make sense of them and sometimes they're they're, they're too obtuse or too long, too complicated. Uh, what we don't have now is a simple legal system based upon a, a limited number of basic principles through which people could understand what their obligations were and run their lives accordingly. That wow. has become a pipe dream. What a profound statement. And I just marvel at this historically because, and, and not to sound overly simplistic, but I think of the history of the Magna Carta in Runnymede where King John was a horrible king, hmm. was confronted in 1215 <laughs> where they signed the Magna Carta and basically said, look, this is, you're not above the rule of law as the king. So all the complexity that you refer to is really de facto putting the king above the people again, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. And, and the Magna Carta is very interesting. It, it, as you say, it's the source uh, of a lot of, of very good ideas that ended up in our laws. It, it, you know, the rule of law was not invented with the Magna Carta, and we had to return mm -hmm. to that struggle again and again. But you can certainly see the origins in the document there. Um, but part of the problem that we have right now is that unlike at various moments in history, including that one, where you have, if I can put it this way, a different, in Magna Carta, you just had the king, um, but what what would develop from that stage was the development of these three branches of government, you know, the executive branch, which was the king, the legislature, which, which eventually took on the right to make the laws, and the courts, independent of the king, eventually, uh, with the task of applying those laws. And, you know, in, in theory, that sounds great, because you, what you have there is three different branches of government, essentially independent and even hostile to each other to a certain extent, and pledged not to interfere with each other, meaning that none of the three of them would have the power alone to decide what was going to happen in any situation, okay? Because the legislature made the abstract rules, the executive was empowered only to execute what those laws okay. said. And then the courts were empowered only to apply those rules as already set down to the case. Okay, so, so there clearly was a, a, a checks and there was a, a checks, checks and, and balances balance system, a checks and balances system in which essentially all three branches were powerless to do the whole job themselves. And the problem we have today is 
that those three branches, I mean, they do have their differences, of course. They fight about various things. They have conflicts. But in the big picture sense, those three branches now appear to be on the same page about the imperative of the managerial state. The managerial state must exist. It must do what it's doing. It must have the ability to make policy and to direct and to supervise and so on. And, and, and the functions of these three branches are starting to meld with their full cooperation. And so we don't have a good separation of those powers anymore. So this is very disconcerting. Um, so when we talk about the rule of law, how do we protect it? I'm thinking of the Constitution. We're having this discussion. How do we protect the law? It's very difficult because the law is a product of culture, right? And when your culture believes in certain things and you put a legal system in place, then that system is going to obey those, those ideas. And you can even put those ideas in a written document like a constitution and say, oh, by the way, everybody, here are the ideas upon which our system is run. And everybody says, yay. But if those ideas change, if the culture changes, if those ideas are not accepted anymore, then the fact that you have certain ideas set down in black and white on a piece of paper is not in and of itself going to protect you from the, 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 the way the culture has shifted. Wow. And I think that's part of what's happening now. People okay, so, so when I've, I've uh, studied um, law or the philosophy of law, among other things, I recall common law. And I have fond memories of reading, um, you know, Edward Koch and Francis Bacon. And of course, the big one was William Blackstone. Common law was ingenious because it had this hundreds of years of precedent setting. And within it was the DNA, basically a freedom yes. um, and a respect for the individual in those precedents. Right. That's and right. that was such an anchor to our culture. And I thought that was an ingenious way of looking at the, the larger picture of what our constitution is. But you're saying this is all being undermined with what? Uh, the power of the state and, and really a foreign ideology as well, right? Well, yeah, but it all comes, it, it all, like so many things, it all comes back down to the ideas that people have in their heads. And, and, those ideas have been evolving, in my opinion, in a in a bad direction for a long time. So, um, uh, Mr. Justice LaFerre, who was later a justice on the Supreme Court of Canada, wrote mm -hmm. a piece shortly after the charter was was put into place, and he was writing about you know basically introducing the document and what it would what, what it mean. But he 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 made an observation that even before the charter, even before we had rights that were constitutionalized, he said that the role of the courts over time has been to remind the other two branches of the government, the legislature and the executive branch, of the importance of our foundational political values, the foremost of which was individual autonomy. Mm -hmm. and, that was, and that was the court's role, one of the court's functions, he said. But here's the rub. If the courts as an institution no longer put a very high value on that value, if instead they see that other propositions are more important, mm. then the courts don't, won't, won't be playing that role. Even in the face of a constitutional document that says, here are these individual freedoms that are so important we're putting them in a charter what's happened over time this is and this is over decades is that and this has happened very slowly and bit by bit and not consistently but but you can see a trend over time that that uh the, the courts have taken this this roster of what i would consider to be individual freedoms and and have essentially bit by bit reinterpreted it as a blueprint for a progressive society. Oh my. So so this is very disturbing. So it's almost like we we've totally forgotten our own tradition of this Anglo-Saxon tradition of law and as you say respect and and indeed reverence for individual autonomy. And I I don't understand because 
I was always taught this is this is profoundly different than say um, China or Russia or or Mexico or even continental Europe. It's it's entirely different, is it not, Bruce? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But as time goes on, I think you can make a case that these various different national systems are converging towards each other. I mean, that's certainly the case with the common law system and the civil law system in Europe. I mean, at one point they operated you know, in quite a different way based upon different principles. Mm-hmm. In 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 uh, the civil law, you have a code where everything is codified, all the all the legal ideas. Whereas yeah. in the common law, it's not written down in legislation. So, so e.g., the Napoleonic Code. That, that you know, Napoleonic Code. That's right. And each mm-hmm. and each of the civil law countries has its has its own code. That's that's, mm-hmm. that's you know sort of based on that model. And in the common law, though, I mean, if you so. If you want to find out uh, what the rule is on a common law question, um, some countries like the U.S. have a, have a restatement, meaning a, a a a description of what the common law says. But in fact, the principles are in the cases themselves, and you okay. have to go through. Which is one reason why the, the 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 lawyer's job in a common law system is actually quite intricate and complicated and beautiful because you have to go and interpret case after case after case to find out what the what the what the coherent idea is Uh, but but as time has gone on more and more of our law has been codified in statutes and in the civil law countries more and more i mean there's there's, they still don't have a common law system but they're also starting to look at what happened in the latest case because it's not precedent in the same sense that the common law uses precedent but nevertheless their, their, their habits are starting to look a little bit more like it. So you have a convergence, but also we have a convergence with these other countries that you mentioned. I, mean, you know, I would I would make the case that more and more, I'm afraid, more and more, our political class and our political functions are starting to resemble China's instead of the other way around. Well, so as this kind of globalist thinking happens, we tend to um, perhaps blindly or naively adopt those types of ways of thinking, um, indeed culture, and we don't realize the profound uh, significance that has. Well, yes. So part part of the problem here is that if you are if you are part of the of this managerial state, administrative state, and your mandate or you believe your mandate is to manage, to manage society, to manage people. Um, then, then you are going to look for tools to carry out that job, and and the tools are all the bad stuff that we've seen coming down the pipes. You exactly. know, surveillance, digital yeah. ID, digital currency, yeah. uh, in COVID rules. I mean, right. COVID is a manifestation of the idea of managing. We want to manage this so as to minimize this and maximize that. So, all you people, here's what you're going to do. As opposed to saying, look, it's not really our role to protect people from a virus. Mm-hmm. People, you're free. Go and do as you think best to protect yourselves. Mm-hmm. That's not managing the situation. Right. But a very profoundly different posture. Um, so I don't want to lose sight of the fact that part of our judicial system is, you know, there's different layers of it, much like an onion, including the whole area of administrative justice. And I want to come back to that, including judges and police and and um, all kinds of the special roles of ju- uh, ministers of justice and let alone uh, attorney generals. But what I did want to talk about is picking up the whole myriad of threats to freedom in, right. in the law. And we've talked a lot about uh, the state. The size of the state is very much a threat. And you've talked eloquently about um, how, frankly, um, statism or radical socialism is really not compatible with with our tradition of, of a free society. But what would you say is the other issue that's going on here? You, you, you've alluded to, is it is it the kind of social justice that emphasizes oh, yes. outcomes yes. versus equal opportunity? So social justice or Marxism would emphasize the need to drive towards equal outcomes. Is that a threat in your mind as well? Oh, no question. No question. And, and of course, when you're trying to to diagnose the cause of a social phenomenon, it's very difficult because there's inevitably more than one cause. It's difficult to pull apart all the all the threads. 
But but one of those threads is this is this thing called critical theory. And critical theory is a it's not really a theory. It's a it's an agenda or it become an agenda anyway. Critical theory was an academic um, doctrine that started between the two world wars. And when 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 some some scholars got together and said, well, I wonder why Marxism hasn't caught on in the West. So in a sense, they were neo-Marxists. And I'm not even sure that they would have called themselves that. And certainly modern critical theorists probably would object to being categorized that way. But nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that it starts with Marxism. And Marxism is a theory that says that Western civilization is essentially oppressive. But his theme, Marx's theme, was economic oppression, you know, ruling class and working class and capitalism and so on. And the critical theorists sort of let that go, that economic angle go. And instead, eventually what they replaced it with, what came to be identity politics. In other words, it's Western society is, is still oppressive. It's based upon power relationships, it still has to be transformed and undermined. Uh, but it's oppressive power relationships between people with different identities, you know, between uh, men and women, between pieces of people of different races, people of different, se different sexualities and so on. And that's essentially become the governing ethos or its derivatives anyway, the governing ethos. This is, this is modern wokeism. That's where modern wokeism comes, the theory mm. goes, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, th this, this idea of identity politics and, uh, substantive equality, that is equality of outcome, that, that the courts, our Supreme Court of Canada, um, from essentially the first case that it heard on the equality right under the charter, said that the charter required substantive equality. Wow. And I know it's hard to believe, because if you look at the text of Section 15.1, which is where that, mm -hmm. where that yeah. guarantee appears it says every individual has the right essentially to equal treatment under the law and it goes goes on a little bit but it talks about individuals and what it appears to guarantee through my eyes anyway is that everybody has the right to be subject to the same rules and standards as everybody else in the law and then they had section 152 which was which was an exception to 151 and 152 said and remember, this was the 1980s. So 15.2 said, oh, by the way, if you have some kind of affirmative action program uh, to, to compensate for dis disadvantage for a group, well, that, that's going to be okay. We won't, go to, or we won't call that unconstitutional. Okay. So the 15.1 was a guarantee of equal treatment or, if you like, formal equality or, if you like, equality of application. But in other words, the same rules and standards apply to everybody, regardless of your race and sex and sexuality and, and disability and, and so on. This is the, the justice should be blind section of the charter. But over time, and, and from this first case, but even more so as we've gone along, the Supreme Court of Canada has said that 15-1 is not a guarantee of equality of treatment the guarantee of substantive equality meaning equality of outcome between groups and so you can see in skin cases where the same rule is applied to different groups like men and women if there's some difference in the outcome the court says that is contrary to the equality provision of the charter and, and, and in some measure, that's prima facie evidence of repression, and it needs to be changed. Yeah, yes, that's right. And that's consistent with the critical theory idea. Yes, correct. So this is crossing the so-called Rubicon, isn't it? Where Canada it has given up or tilting away from its precious Anglo-Saxon tradition of freedom. Yes, and you mentioned earlier about certain ideas that people held to be self-evident in their heads. And this is yeah. one of them. People assume that one of the bedrocks of Canadian law is that the, the same rules apply to everybody. They don't. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that is not true. That is no longer the case. And it has not been the case for a while. Okay, so I, I think this is the paradox of what's going on, isn't it? That, Bruce, 
most Canadians, I think, would be shocked and dismayed by what you're saying. And they would be disturbed with the notion that somehow not everyone's treated equally under the law anymore. Right. I agree. Yes. Yep. This that's, is like that, animal that, farm. That is, that is in good part the problem. I mean, it's not the only problem, but it certainly begins there. Yes. So the fountainhead, the origins of this nonsense, let me guess is, I mean, I've studied the Frankfurt School for years and all the rest, but the fountainheads are the universities. And we know that um, the humanities are now dominated by by Marxists. I think many people will be shocked to know that, but but it's true. So what about well, there, 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 Mar are Marxists, there, there are Marxists and there are neo-Marxists and there are critical yeah. theorists, but, but sure. yes, I get the, I get yeah. the point. Yes. There's yeah. all the, the, the sure. variety and, and right. colors and flourishes, yes. But the law schools are obviously very important, and I could mention police academies as well, among other uh, justice institutes and, and all the rest. These are important centers as we teach the next generation of lawyers. Mm -hmm. So does legal education include teaching the next generation about our shared Canadian culture then in the Anglo-Saxon tradition? Or how do, how do they walk the line on this? And I know that I'm not, I, I fear asking you this question because I know that you haven't done a, a full-scale full scale analysis of every law school. But what is your experience in this regard? Are we losing that tradition of profound respect for individual rights and freedoms and the yes. Constitution and tolerance? We are losing respect for the idea of individual autonomy. Yes. So uh, most, if not all, of our law schools in this country, to, to differing degrees, uh, promote themselves as champions of social justice. And uh, again, to differing degrees, they they do so in part in their curriculum and, and, and many of their professors uh, believe in that cause as well. And that cause, I mean, people can have causes and have beliefs I and mean, I have no problem with sure. that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I think, and, and it's not true to every professor by any means either, uh, <laughs> but, but as an institution, law schools have taken on the mantle of being social justice institutions. And, and, and social justice is, is sort of a, a cousin, if you like, of critical theory. And and it relies upon the idea of substantive equality. Critical race theory is, is a product of the American legal economy and has been embraced in the Canadian. And they're all, they're all cousins of each other. Uh -huh. and, and so the proposition that, um, that there should be equal treatment under the law as opposed to substantive equality is uh, a, an idea that at many law schools would be greeted with hostility. My, oh my, I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that. Um, it's, it's frankly sad. So is there a, there's not even a debate going on within law schools? Is that your impression yeah. now in Canada? There, there, I mean, there, there can be debate between, you know, between individuals uh, about anything, including mm -hmm. that, but there's no serious institutional debate about that as i as i alluded to i mean some law schools have gone so far not all of them but some of them have gone so far as to put this in their governing documents to say you know here here's our here's our you know five-year plan we're we're promoting social justice in these ways wow. so this raises profound questions then about the utility of universities and quite frankly why is the taxpayer funding them sure well one of the problems is that this critical theory set of ideas that I mentioned earlier, I mean, came to us from the universities. And in many ways, you could say to the extent that that is one of the causes of this present moment, the universities have been detrimental to society instead of the other way around. Wow. Uh, there's, there's, there's an old saying, and it's there's some confusion about who, who originally said it. It's attributed to people like Henry Kissinger as, as well as others, but who knows? But the, But the saying goes something like this. University politics is so vicious precisely because there's so little at stake. Yes. <laughs> right? Now, that, that's, that's funny if it was true. But, but it now looks like it's not true at all. Now mm -hmm. it looks like universities 
are dangerous places in, in the sense that they have seeded certain ideas through the culture. And generations of graduates who have been taught the premises of critical theory as though it is the real world mm -hmm. are now the ones who are running the institutions, which is why Indeed. so many of our institutions in part are, 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 are compromised. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so that that is um, a sobering, uh, powerful overview of that particular issue and the challenges of a frankly destructive alien ideology that is undermining, um, as as you said so well, the uh, importance and respect for the autonomy of the individual. If we could turn our attention then to other threats, one would be logically corruption, right? If we think of political interference or corruption poses a threat to our legal system, do you observe that uh, consistently? I mean, I could certainly give you many examples, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yes. So corruption in the literal sense is very difficult to diagnose because it's very difficult to know what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, it would be corruption, for example, if a member of the government, you know, called up a judge on the phone. That, that you know the minister of justice called up the judge on the phone and said i hear you're hearing such and such a case okay i there's no reason to think that that kind of thing is happening mm -hmm. not not at all um there's no evidence of it uh, and there's no reason to, to to believe it and when we say that institutions are being corrupted we don't mean it in that sense we don't mean it in the telephone call sense we don't mean it in the money in a brown paper envelope mm -hmm. on the door sense no no we, we mean it in the in, in the intellectual sense, in the philo philosophical sense. So this critical theory idea, if it becomes infiltrated into these various institutions and people begin to function with those ideas as opposed to uh, a, a, the competing set of you know, Western ideas, if you like, then uh, that would be the kind of moment where a guy like me would say, you know, that, that institution has been corrupted by critical theory. That's what we okay. mean. Now, yeah. to, the, to the extent that there are other kinds of more concrete corruption activities going on, I difficult to know. Okay. So let's turn our attention a little bit to the investigative function. We know that uh, police are, are incredibly important. It's important that they're impartial, professional, and frankly, enabled to do their job without political interference, as, sure. as per our earlier discussion. Mm -hmm. So I did want to reflect a little bit about, um, there's so many examples I could give, but there's been numerous acts of violent attacks and blockades in our, in, in our country. We think of um, uh, just a few years ago, the uh, blockades regarding um, the National Railway, which arguably created hundreds of millions of dollars worth of economic damage uh, to people's livelihoods. And a lot of things have been undertaken these, these acts of violence and vandalism, frankly, without consequence over the years. There's so many to mention. Mm -hmm. And the silence is deafening. And mm -hmm. uh, I hear this regularly from people. One of the many examples is, is uh, quite frankly, this past year, we're at Coastal Gas Link project, which is a very important project for the li livelihood livelihoods of not only Canada, but many, many First Nations. And uh, I recall that uh, on February the 17th, between 20 and 40 axe wielding assail assailants descended on the Morris, Morris Rivers drill site where they attacked workers and caused millions of dollars of damage. And later this month, uh, several vehicles owned by the RCMP, BC Hydro and Coastal Gas Link again, were vandalized in Smithers, BC. And uh, we know that there's been numerous other blockades undertaken. And this is despite the objections of various First Nation chiefs and councillors that represent the area. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, well, why are these acts not being prosecuted? Does that raise serious questions in your mind about the functioning, let alone the political direction that's being given to the RCMP? Well, it raises questions for sure. but. Um, regardless of what is actually happening behind the scenes, there is also a, a simple explanation, not a good one, not 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 a, not a not an attractive one, but an explanation that goes like this. Um, I'm I'm, I'm going to go back to critical theory for a minute. 
what one of the ideas embedded in critical theory is I call it repressive tolerance. And repressive Sorry, tolerance. I mean, repressive yeah. tolerance? Repressive tolerance. Repressive tolerance was a, a piece written by a critical uh, theory scholar named Herbert Marcuse. And yes. he basically said that movements from the left must be tolerated even when they are violent, while movements from the right must not be tolerated, even if they require violence to put them down. In other words, the theory goes, this is the source of our uneven hand in the way laws are made, the way laws are enforced. And for my money, this is a much more powerful uh, compromising our institutions than if you had, you know, actual political direction, because mm -hmm. you don't need political direction when the people involved in the institutions have the idea that it is it is proper, it is proper to tolerate and not interfere when somebody's doing something violent or illegal in the name of some leftist cause, and you name some, and that's that's essentially what happens. It's hands off. But, you know, when the Trekkers come to Ottawa and are peacefully protesting a policy, no violence, no destruction, no threats, uh, what, comes, what happens is it comes down hard. Why? Well, because that's a movement from the right. And the, and the pattern that you're describing is entirely consistent with the idea of repressive tolerance, which itself is a product of critical theory. Yeah, so this is this is quite disturbing because I think the the irony is that this creates, I believe, a, a perception, rightly so, that there is a double standard of law absolutely play here, and yeah. it undermines the perceived legitimacy of our legal system. And yeah. if there's a time where we need a respect uh, for for not just simply the law but for each other, this serves to undermine that very point. Right, but so we, but th this is the the second double standard we've talked about in our conversation, right? So the, the, this is the, this is one. The substantive equality is a double standard because you have some groups having different rules applied to them than others, and having double standards is a terrific way, as you say, to undermine confidence in the law. People will start to believe they're not going to get a fair shake if they're defining fair shake as the thought that the same standards will be applied to them as to other people. So ultimately then this, this is the dead end, is it not? Like I'm, I'm very familiar with the writings of Hermit Marcuse, he was a nut. And in this case, we know that these are policy dead ends because ultimately they will result in a situation where people will be frankly fighting for their livelihood and there's the risk that there will be violence if not um vigilantism quite frankly yeah. but but you, but this but you you're right on the right on the point which is that all of these trends point to a very dark place we're, we're going to a very bad place in in these ways and others you're going to a place where you can't see the good outcome where yes. people are people are you know peaceful and, and live together um, and, and, and make their way in their lives, you know, self-directed. I mean, that, that that's becoming the, 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 the aspiration that seems not possible anymore. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And that would be a tragedy. So let's turn our attention now to COVID-19. And you've alluded yeah. to a number of very powerful examples Right. Um, we saw the measures and lockdowns, and that was clearly a, an assault on many rights and freedoms. I think of the recent case regarding travel mandates, all of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, involving a number of parties, including our friend, the Honorable Brian Peckford, the last living signatory of the, ironically, the Charter. Mm -hmm. um, and that was uh, put aside. And uh, I know it, it will likely be appealed but uh, that probably won't be heard for years. Are you surprised by this? Um, well, I can't say that I'm surprised. So, so <laughs> there have been many moments during COVID when I've been shocked, but not surprised. And 
and I suppose this could be one of them in the sense that there, there's a, I mean, the case was moot. Uh, moot means that there's no longer an active dispute because the moment has passed. And so technically speaking, the, the case was moot. There was no longer a problem because the policy had been dropped. Mm -hmm. But, but there's an important uh, exception. Generally speaking, courts don't hear moot cases. They hear real cases. They don't, they don't, they, they, they won't pontificate on theoretical situations. And so when a case becomes moot, generally it stops. But the exception is when, 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 and there's a, there's a three-step test, but, but essentially for our purposes, when, when you have a very important matter of, of public interest and public policy that needs to be resolved, then is, it is within the discretion of a court to hear the case and to tell us all what the story, story is. And that seems to me to be the case here, because if it's not the case here, that the, the message is that the government can avoid a challenge at any time on any mm -hmm. policy simply by making sure that they drop the policy before the thing is heard. Yeah, surely this is a disingenuous sidestep of the issue. Right. Yes. Okay, so you wrote recently in the Epoch Times, I think it was the October 19 edition, that three judges forbear COVID hegemony in the courts right. and basically sidestep the work of facts by using judicial notice. Right. Can you tell right. us more about that one? Sure, yes. Yeah. So judicial notice, so let's, let's go back a step. When you allege a fact in uh, a, a legal action, you have to prove that fact with evidence. You bring your witnesses into the courtroom and you ask them what happened, or you bring expert evidence, uh, expert witnesses in, and you ask them their opinion about the facts that have been established. But you need evidence, and those evidence, the evidence comes through witnesses. And the whole idea of adjudication in our system is that the judges don't know anything about what happened until they hear it in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the beauties of our system is that the judges are equipped to do the findings of fact and to hear the cases, not because they have expertise and experience, but because they don't, because they are blank slates. Yeah, and by the definition of being do, an impartial adjudicator. An impartial adjudicator. They come in without a preconception about what the yeah. situation is. And they're supposed to find facts exclusively on what they hear inside the courtroom. Now, judicial notice is an exception to that rule because there are some things that are so well established and obvious that you wouldn't want to spend judicial resources on making a party prove the fact. You know, the sky is blue, a statute with royal assent has been properly passed, and so on, unless the issue is raised for some reason. But judicial notice is not supposed to be used to resolve the factual matters in dispute in the case. And so one matter that's been in dispute in, in several family law cases is uh, uh, separated or divorced parents, but whether the children should be vaccinated for COVID. And in those cases, of course, one of the matters that may be in dispute is whether or not the, COVID is, the uh, vaccine is effective, whether or not it's dangerous, and to what extent the child is at risk for COVID. And in, in a number of cases, uh, courts, in, in order to avoid having to resolve those matters based upon an, an assessment of scientific evidence and expert evidence, have taken judicial notice of both the risk of the virus to the children and the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. said, I'm taking judicial notice of those things, meaning I don't need any evidence. Yeah, which which is surprising given the fact that that so many, um, ironically, health authorities that impose mandates are asserting that the risks for children are extremely low. Well, sure, but yes, but the but the one thing that the courts um, have seemed to be extremely reluctant to do in this period is to be the ones to delve into. The scientific that's the science on COVID to assess the scientific positions of the authorities versus those critics who say the authorities are all wet. They just have not wanted to do that. They wanted to avoid yeah. it at all costs. And this is one way that some courts have avoided it to say, I'm taking okay. judicial notice. The, the public health authorities say the vaccine is safe and effective. 
Therefore, I'm concluding that the vaccine is safe and effective by taking judicial notice of that fact. So I, in my, in my book, it's an entirely inappropriate use of judicial notice. And this is what those three judges uh, said, the, the one that, that I cited in the, in the column that you mentioned. Three judges, uh, Superior Court of Ontario, Family Court, uh, basically said, no, this is not what judicial notice is for. This is, okay. this is a, a so, proper use of so is it as it becomes um common knowledge about the facts and risks regarding COVID 19 are so low um i'm referring to people that are specifically children in this case um right. and people with with no comorbidities um as that becomes commonly known are you optimistic that that uh, type of of um posture with judges will change inevitably well, let's hope Let's hope. Okay. I, I, I do not know. And, and so one of the open questions right now is whether the what, what it would appear to you and me as the actual facts on COVID are actually going to ever be acknowledged as the facts or whether or not there's going to be a continuous, continuing campaign to to obscure and deny and change the channel and and make it so that those facts sort of never come into common knowledge okay i don't know i mean i hope that's i hope that's impossible but well no but it, it's a very important point bruce because we know that uh three weeks ago there have been very important revelations out yep. of the u.s where we had a whistleblower come forward who confirmed what many of us had su suspected for some time that the department of homeland security has um significant agreements with all the big tech players which of course frame up the nature of the public discussion around the world including in canada that there are particular messages of censorship and uh, shadow banning on all these kinds of messages in the social domain yeah. and so they have effect effectively worked vigorously to define using their money and, and state resources, much like your thesis around the size of the managerial state, right. to very much control the, the the message that's going out about this, this whole issue, among others. And right. I think that was a very significant revelation uh, that is now in the public domain. And uh, Yes. Whether that would yes. change, I'm not sure. But that I think that was a very significant revelation, was it not, Bruce? Oh, I agree. I agree. But here's the problem. I mean, in a sense, it's a moment of truth. The moment of truth is going to be whether or not anybody cares. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you and I care because that's 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 contrary to the principles upon which we think government should operate. Right. It's 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 contrary to the rule of law, it's contrary to individual autonomy, it's contrary to free speech, and all of, all of those things. But the problem is that a lot of people don't care because mm -hmm. they're already thinking in the other way. Okay, but, but, but looking at the legal profession, the legal yeah. profession plays a very special role within, can, within our society sure. because for, for many reasons that you've, you've um, enunciated, but one of which is that they believe that facts and evidence matter. Well, they do in a courtroom, but I'm not sure that that you can say that across the board. I mean, um, um, so I mean, again, I let's go. Let's go again. Let's go back to critical theory because one one of the closely related schools of thought to critical theory is postmodernism. Right. Postmodernism, indeed, stands yeah. for the proposition essentially. That 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 facts are socially contingent. In other words, there, there is no objective <laughs> truth, right? And but but that idea is also being incorporated into social justice and critical race theory and so on. So if you come forward with facts to to show that you know that that the the social justice cause that you're promoting is not actually supported by the facts, indeed, yes, that, that's not an argument to them. Yeah, that's not an argument. Yeah. If you come forward, because this this collection of doctrines is an anti-Western and therefore, in a sense, anti-Enlightenment campaign. And the idea of the Enlightenment and the scientific method and the idea of, of, of observation and, and discovery and objectivity, 
those things are being condemned as Western and oppressive. So if you come forward with facts to undermine a social justice cause, all you are doing is demonstrating your Westernness and your mm -hmm. oppressiveness, and you should be dismissed because you're not with the program. Indeed. So this is a very eloquent summation of the kind of fork in the roads that we see between civilization and, frankly, an absurd chaos, is it not, Bruce? Because if, okay. if, if facts don't matter and it's all about driving to some uh, bizarre sense of equal outcome, then um, our society's in big trouble. Sure. Exactly. Without trying to sound too historical. Oh, no. I don't think, no? I, 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 think, I think we're in a pickle. Okay, so this is part of your, your, your position. So that gets us to a very interesting case study or piece of legislation in Canada called Bill 11 or sorry, mm -hmm. line, which right. is really all about censorship and really ratcheting down, again, what's to be discussed, what's acceptable views, to coin a phrase from the Prime Minister, um, and frankly, define what's going to be discussed in the public square. And this is yeah. really an attack, an assault on freedom of speech as we try to earnestly discuss issues and seek the truth. Is this not yeah. right? Uh, yes, Chris? yes, yes, it is, absolutely. I mean, it, it is a it is a redefining of what free speech means. Uh, it, it's so. Let, let's back up a step. Part of the part of the problem in the way that that our society is now, now thinking about free speech is that they're connecting it to truth. Indeed, I mean they're expecting there's a, there's an expectation somehow that. That what you hear on the TV or we read online is going to be true. And this is where the complaints about misinformation come from. People are, should not be allowed to utter misinformation about COVID or anything else. And this is part of the rationale that the government being give, is giving for supervising, if you like, censoring online speech. Misinformation. But, okay, so so let's just clarify for a second. What's the yeah. difference between misinformation and disinformation? Oh, uh, well, but, but you see, it doesn't matter. That so let me, let me go let me go to my point though. Re the point is this: free speech does not have to be true. Oh, I Truth see. is not the criteria for free speech. You're allowed to express your opinions and your ideas, not because they're true but because they are yours. There is no obligation to speak the truth. So it depends on who the speaker is. It depends upon who the speaker is now. So the so identity, the extent, the extent to which speech is regarded to be legitimate is starting to become whether or not it reflects the imperatives of critical theory and social justice. So, so you're allowed, of course. So note this. It's not that you're not allowed to be critical. You're allowed to be critical of Christianity and Western civilization and white people and the list goes on. You're allowed to be critical, but you can't be critical of those other things or defend the, that list I just gave you because that would be outrageous. And so let's put it this way. We're coming to the point where to be progressive, if you like, I'm going to use that label, but, but, but by progressive, I mean... I mean, I mean, woke, I mean, critical theory related, I mean, illiberal, I mean, I mean, authoritarian, that that collection of ideas that is now starting to dominate our, our public life. If you are on board with that, then you are a reasonable person. If you are not on board with that, you are wrong. And wrong people should not be entitled to spread misinformation. That's that's where we're going. Okay, so that's the that's the central element of C eleven. Yeah. And if you're not concerned about that one, no one will. Nothing will get you upset. Right. So it's important to uh, let your your views be known. Call your 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 elected official and uh, make your new your your views known. Okay, I do want to turn to another fascinating aspect or use of the law in the political context. And this is, of course, we've all watched the several weeks, the testimony regarding the use 
of the Emergency Act um, and that associated inquiry. Um, it's becoming clear now that the federal government had no basis or rationale for the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Time and time again, every single assertion that has been made is either um, witness after witness, let me put it this way, including the heads of police and intelligence have frankly shredded the federal case that it, there was any justification to use the act. Is that your observation as well? Yes, yes, I agree. Yep, yep. So oh, there, was, I, there was no violent group or imminent a threat no. And to say otherwise is, is, is not grounded in fact at all. So are you concerned that the federal government would use such a drastic legal measure, the A-bomb, if you will, when it comes to legal action, and what appears to be, quite frankly, the persecution of citizens um, as people serve jail time, as they serve uh, or pay enormous fines, and even freezing of bank accounts? Yes. So the question is, am I afraid they'll do that again? Yes. Yes. Sure. I don't think, I'm, I suspect, and who knows, but I suspect that even in the face of the evidence that you're describing, there will be powers that be that will not be disturbed by the fact that, that, that they've been exposed in this way. I think that they would regard it as legitimate. And the explanation for that is, I mean, this for me goes back to the, 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 the time itself. So while this was ongoing, um, I was in Ottawa at the time and I gave a press conference the morning after the act was invoked. And on that morning before the press conference, the justice minister was asked by a reporter you know what why why had they invoked the act did, did, did the government uh know about uh, had they had reports about weapons in the trucks you know what was going on and the, and the public safety minister said well no we don't have any reports of weapons um he said it's it's the rhetoric he said it's the rhetoric the rhetoric the rhetoric it's the rhetoric of an ideological position he said now now, it, in in normal times, that would be met by 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 disbelief, because what he's actually said is, no, no, this was just about speech. <laughs> A bunch of people came up to protest mandates and reflected a, an ideology in their protests. I mean, that would be intolerable. But we're now in an era of of, of of critical theory reinterpretation of words okay and so you can, you, can, you can list the words that are being reinterpreted there's a whole long list of them rule of law freedom and so on but one of those words is violence and violence is being reinterpreted to mean ideas i don't like okay so so in other words um freedom of speech must be ended because you are giving me offense and, uh, and and it was it, it was actually a threat to the government because the expression of that rhetoric was an ideological position that was contrary to the government. And mm -hmm. so I could understand how they thought it was an emergency, a political emergency, but it was clearly not an emergency in the sense of the act. Of course. Yeah. Because quite frankly, it's turning into an embarrassment and um, it, it needs to be called out. Well, I hope um, it is. I hope it is. But, but one of the things that characterizes the way public authorities function now is that they are without shame. They take all kinds of measures that are, are really on the face of them outrageous. And this is probably the best example. Outrageous. And no shame at all. They think it's justified because, again, they are the managers. And in order to manage, they require tools. And this is just a tool. Okay, so so let's just turn the tables for a sec then, Bruce. On this yeah. issue, yeah. on the Emergency Measures Act and its invocation, the harms it did, and uh, say COVID-19 and those yeah. associated issues. And let's recall, when it comes to COVID-19, we had all kinds of bizarre contradictions that we've uh, named for, for some time now. You could go to Walmart, but you could not go to uh, your corner grocery store, or you could not go to church. 
Um, so are are there are is there inevitably going to be um, significant cases of civil liability and consequences and redress for citizens? At what point do politicians get per, uh, sued personally uh, for the kind of harms they've done on people's lives and their 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 way of life? I've I've had so many. Um, yeah, persons yeah. I've known personally who could not even say goodbye to their dying mother, yes, uh, or or be able to uh, work in a context because they were very concerned about the uh, the possibility of uh, you know uh, vaccination. I, I got vaccinated myself, so I, d I don't mean to to sound otherwise, but I'm I'm getting at the point again to the respect for individual freedom and autonomy to make their own decisions and not be not to be right. patronized by the by the state. Right, right. I, and, I, and I, like you, know a lot of people who are in similar situations just suffered tremendously because... I mean, it's, of, it's heartbreaking. It, it really was. It was, it was, a, it was a terrible moment in our history. Uh, but, but to establish liability is not going to be easy. Uh, there have been lots of challenges, as you know, to various kinds of COVID rules, and most of them have been unsuccessful. So we, we, we generally lack um, judicial declarations that, that many of these things were, were unlawful. And so it's going to be very difficult indeed to go one step beyond that and say, well, the people who put these in place must be liable. Well, legally, where are you going to go? Because the, exactly. apparently so far, anyway, maybe this will change, hopefully, but so far the, the policies have been upheld. Okay. And so very difficult to figure out how somebody could be liable for putting in a policy that was lawful. So again, we'll see how this evolves and we'll certainly monitor it closely. And it gets me to my next point, which is the appointment of judges in Canada. It's, um, it's a very interesting process. So a lot of it is a little bit of a black box. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm frankly somewhat concerned about what's really going on there in terms of of um, the appointment of judges, to what extent that they actually carry um, a sensible perspective on the law? Is there a way that we could could improve the appointment of judges? Should it be, frankly, a public process? Well, I think it should be. Yes, I, I've always been in favor of that. But it's okay. a public process at the high levels in the, the United States, okay. uh, and, and yeah. you know, some local judges have to run for office. But at the, but it's an appointment, of course, at the Supreme Court and other okay. courts. Because I know. Um, and, and the, yeah, go ahead. So I, I was just going to say, Bruce, I note the recent appointment to our Supreme Court of a member who, frankly, is is um, does not have a lot of experience um, by any measure, but has had their doctoral thesis um, sealed. Yes. And th yes. this, to me, is a huge flag around basic questions around why would you do that as a government? Why would you put something that should be in the public record, their, namely their doctoral thesis, uh, so that people cannot evaluate it. Right, right, uh, sure, sure. But but our, our process has been very sort of behind closed doors traditionally anyway. And, and one of the criticisms that you've, you will have heard from Canadian uh, law people over a period of time is a criticism of the dirty laundry that they go through in the United States over their judicial appointments, especially to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But in my books, that's a very good thing because you actually know what you're getting. Even if you don't like it and the person is, is confirmed, at least it's transparent. But exactly. in Canada, we don't, we, don't, we don't like doing that. Yeah. And I think that's to our detriment. And, and, and one reason, I think, maybe, and this, this applies not just to the appointment of judges, but applies more generally to our political arena. The United States at least has a difference of opinion inside its political realm. And they and they and they are in conflict. And and again, Canadian voices say, well look, you know, look how much conflict they're in. But to my mind, that's a good thing. The problem with Canada has been over a period of time is that everybody's been basically on the same page okay and there hasn't been an opposing voice yeah in the details sure you know liberal conservative different policies and so on but on the big picture items there hasn't really been a genuine opposition and we are the worst off for it. 
so we would we would benefit from that kind of debate. Okay. Well, look, I know that we're in the home stretch here, but I did want to uh, clarify that I want to turn to action and what we can do. Okay. But I, I I think there is truly the the profound irony that. You know, it's always been said that those that govern, govern at the behest or the consent of the governed. Right. So trust is involved here. And I think that, Bruce, this has been a very powerful discussion as we've examined the markers of a high-functioning uh, justice system and then how that's being, frankly, undermined and attacked in so many levels. Are you concerned, though, that we risk losing um, the consent as Canadians figure out that the justice system really is not following any sense of rule of law as we would imagine it to be, that we risk undermining um, the support for our justice system and indeed the state, the government, uh, as we realize that they're more about serving themselves than they are serving Canadians. You, you, you'd like to think that a critical mass of people will come to the understanding and resolution that that things are not right and that they deserve better from their political class and from their institutions including legal institutions i i would like to think that was that is the case and, and it may happen on the other hand a lot of these trends have been in place for quite a while we just we we referred earlier to the idea that the law is now complicated and, and and discretionary and difficult to figure out and, and inaccessible to people. And that's been the case for a while. And yet they put up with it and probably don't know what to do about it. And I don't blame them. Um, whether or not we are coming to a real inflection point on those scores, maybe. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to hope so. I'd like to hope that there is still room and time for genuine, serious reform of the way our laws are made and 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 executed and applied for sure but it's it's going to be a very tall hill to climb because there are so many f interested forces who don't want to see that happen institutions government institutions are, are institutions of all kinds as soon as they are created um they, they, they take on their own purposes, and the very first important purpose they take on is their own survival and prosperity. And so there are a lot, there are a lot of public institutions that we have now who, who really don't have any interest in, in that kind of reform. So, Bruce, as you turn to action, is there advice that you would give us as citizens beyond not um, giving money to a university, ironically, um, what what can we do as citizens? We call our MP, uh, call our members of, the, you know, what what should we do? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, calling your MP is always always sort of the standard the standard answer, and and I mean, it's not a bad idea. But I mean, I mean, I'm sure lots of people have done that on various issues, and not very much happens. Probably because MPs themselves are not very powerful. Um, I, I mean, I I'm not saying don't do that. I mean, do do that, but but at the same time, what we're really after is the creation of a culture that thinks that we're on the wrong track, like a seriously on the wrong track. And to do that, you need to build community. You need to build understanding with the people that you have in your lives, your families, your colleagues, your friends. And you can't be afraid to talk about these things and point out how off the track we've become. And that's often not a very popular message. It certainly was not a popular message during COVID. Uh, that's probably the best the best example of the difficulty that people run into when they say, you know, the, the government shouldn't be doing this. Uh, a lot of people are hostile to that view because it makes them think for themselves. It's one thing that people, some people don't really want to do. So we got a lot of work ahead of us. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for this conversation. And indeed, you give us a measure of hope, as we are certainly um, glad and honored that you, you're a part of the uh, Frontier community, as we encourage people to be not only aware, but to act accordingly on this very important issue. So educator, author, and friend of Frontier, Bruce, Professor Bruce Party, thank you so much for being with us today and for your leadership.
Thank you, David. Thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure. So on behalf of all of us at Frontier, that brings uh, an end to our uh, significant discussion today about the state of law in our country. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us. And uh, at Frontier, uh, we continue to be involved in these and so many other issues, including uh, be sure to look at our website for important resources about this topic. And also as we continue to support as a partner the public inquiry regarding the management of COVID-19 and the lessons learned. Be sure to look at our website and sign up for our newsletter and subscribe to our channels on YouTube, Rumble, and Getter. And thank you for all of those of you who donate to Frontier. You make our mission possible. Your support makes it happen, so thank you. And remember, without open discussion and debate, you are not thinking and nor are you free. So keep asking good questions and do not be afraid. And on behalf of all of us at Frontier, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.